to walk in step with someone is to be in harmonious relationship with them. Uh, And the very simple question I have for you this morning is, as you walk through life, with whom are you in step? Are you someone who is walking in step with our Lord Jesus? Or are you someone who is simply walking in step with everyone else? According to the Bible, the more in step we are with our Lord Jesus, the more out of step we will be with those who don't know him. Uh, Some years ago, there was an experiment conducted to, to study the effect of peer pressure on young people. Uh, And the participants were told that their eyesight was going to be tested. Uh, And some cards were going to be held up, a bit like this, featuring three lines, A, B, and C. The participants were told that the lines would be of various lengths. Sometimes A would be the longest, sometimes B, sometimes C, and so on. The participants were simply told that they were to raise their hand when the longest line was pointed to. Uh, But what one of the guys involved in the experiment didn't know was that nine of the teenagers, there were ten, nine of them were secretly told that they should vote for the second longest line. And the whole question was, what would the tenth young person do? So the researchers held up the card like this. And as you can see, uh, A is clearly the longest. Yes, you can see that? I think A is the longest. Would you agree? Um, but, but when the, the person conducted the experiment pointed to B, nine of the young people all put their hand up. Uh, and the tenth young man looked really confused. He, he later explained his thinking. He said, perhaps I didn't listen properly to the instructions. I'd better do the same as everyone else or they'll laugh at me. And so after a moment, he raised his hand along with the rest of them. Now, before repeating the test, the instructions are underlined. Raise your hand when we point to the longest line. Uh, And so a second card was held up. Uh, And this time you can see that C's, I think you'll see C's the longest, yes? But again, when when the the person conducting the, the, the research pointed at B, nine of the young people put their hands up. Uh, And the poor teenager, he hesitated a bit longer, but eventually his hand up went as well. And he did the same over and over again, even though he knew the others were wrong. Now, was he alone? Far from it. More than 75% of young people tested behaved in exactly that way. They preferred to say the short line was longer than the long line, rather than stand out from the crowd. It was more important to fall into step with the majority than to be the odd one out. Now let's be honest. It's not just teenagers who conform to peer pressure. It's a pressure felt by us all. It's far easier to conform than to be different. And yet if we're those who profess faith in our Lord Jesus this morning... That's what we're called to be, different. As a result of God's mercy to us, we're called not to conform to the pattern of this world, but rather to be conformed to the pattern set by our Lord Jesus. And that is the truth declared by Psalm 1. As Psalm 1 describes someone who stands out from all those around them because they walk in step with God. Now, very simply, Psalm 1 sets out two ways to live. On the one hand, there is the way of the blessed one and those in step with him. And on the other, there is the the way of the wicked many and those in step with them. Now, before we go any further, it's probably worth asking, why does this book of Psalms start with Psalm 1? I want to suggest two simple reasons. Reason number one is it's a teaching psalm. It reminds us that the Psalms are, first of all, God's word to us before they can ever become our words to or about God. Uh, The second reason is that the Psalm depicts a dynamic living relationship with God through his word. Uh, When we think of the Psalms, 
we probably think of the Psalms as a collection of, of hymns, of songs of praise. Uh, the Psalm book of Psalms is often described as the song book of God's people. And, and there's an element of truth in that. But actually, the book of Psalms contains more than songs of praise. There are Psalms of confession of sin. There are Psalms that are prayers, prayers of lament. There are Psalms like Psalm 1 that are teaching or preaching Psalms. And the reason is that the Psalms are all about walking through life in relationship with God. That's what Psalm 1 shows us. So what does Psalm 1 teach? Well, let me suggest three things. First of all, it teaches that the best way to live is in step with God. Look at verse 1. It starts with the word blessed. It's sometimes translated happy. To be blessed is to be in the best of positions. It's a bit like being on holiday in Southwold. Well, that's how our family think of it anyway. You, you get to go there all the time because you live near there. But verse 1 has the sense of, oh, the happiness of. Oh, how fortunate is this person described. And the psalm highlights three distinctives of being in this best of positions. First of all, we learn that it means avoiding peer pressure to sin. Look at verse 1. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. The wicked, the sinners, the mockers, uh, they're just ways of describing the same people. Those who deliberately and proudly go their own way instead of God's. But the blessed one, he avoids falling into step with the wicked. The blessed one avoids the peer pressure to travel along that path that sinners take. The blessed one avoids the peer pressure to join with those who mock both God's ways and those who seek to go God's way. One modern paraphrase puts it very graphically. It says, the blessed man doesn't follow evil men's advice or hang around with sinners or scoff at the things of God. Uh, another paraphrase puts it even more graphically. Uh, it, it reads, he doesn't hang out at Sin Saloon. He doesn't slink along Dead End Road. He doesn't go to Smart Mouth College. But what shapes his life instead? Well, delighting in what God wants. Verse 2. But whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. The law of the Lord is the opposite of the way that sinners take. Uh, the law of the Lord is God's directions, our creator's instructions for life. And this blessed one, we're told, he, he delights in what God wants. Think of a husband. He loves his wife. Over the years, he's come to know her likes and her dislikes. Well, what will it mean for him to delight in what she wants? Will it mean more than just knowing what pleases her? It will mean doing what pleases her. Doing what she wants. And the blessed one who delights in the law of the Lord is not the man who just says, I like what God wants. No, it's the man who delights to actually do what God wants. Who, who says to God, my delight, my pleasure, the thing that I enjoy doing more than anything else is doing what you say is good. And as a result, what does he do? Well, he meditates on what God wants day and night. Now, there's nothing mystical about med meditation. It just means thinking something over seriously. Chewing it over, thinking it through, uh, that its meaning, its implications might, as it were, soak in, be understood, applied in practice. And for the blessed one, meditating on what God wants is his constant activity, day and night, when there aren't other things that need to be thought about. This blessed one is, is thinking about God's word. 
And even when his mind is addressing other things, the, the counsel of God's word is shaping what he thinks and what he says and what he does. Now, will you notice something? You're still with me, aren't you? Will you notice the connection between verses 1 and 2? The negative of verse 1, what is avoided, and the positive of verse 2, what is delighted in, they go together. It's only by delighting in and meditating upon God's word that the blessed one is able to avoid being moulded by peer pressure to sin. And what God wants so shapes his life because he is avoiding that peer pressure to sin. It's a chicken and egg situation. One follows the other. One is vital to the other. And leads to the third distinctive. The blessed one, the best way to life is being like a fruitful, live is being like a fruitful tree. Look at verse 3. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. I think the image is meant to take us back to the Garden of Eden and the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. In most eastern countries, trees flourish most by the side of rivers. Even though all around them may be burned up with heat and drought, they're fresh, they're green, producing fruit covered with leaves. And this blessed one being described is firmly, securely planted by the life-giving streams of the law of God. The fruit produced uh, is fruit in season. It's the attitudes and behaviours appropriate to every circumstance experienced. And this best life, it's not a monastic life, but the idea of fruit gives the idea of it being of benefit to others. Continual dependence upon the word of God makes the best life evergreen. The blessed one's leaves do not wither. And whatever is done prospers. Oh, perhaps not in the eyes of the, the wicked, the sinners and the mockers, but in the eyes of the Lord whose will is his delight. Now I hope you're finding that picture attractive. I am. How different from the many wicked. Uh, look at verse 4. It, its opening words are emphatic. They could be translated, not so the wicked, not so, exclamation mark, double exclamation mark. Uh, whatever good things might be said of this blessed one, the opposite is true of the wicked many. What the wicked avoids? Well, it's not the peer pressure to sin. They avoid what God wants. They reverse verses 1 and 2. The wicked don't delight in the law of the Lord. They do not meditate on God's law day and night. And that means that they allow other things to fill their minds and affections. If we ask of the wicked many what shapes their lives, well, it's the peer pressure to sin. Look again at verse 1. Uh, there's a downward worsening progression in verse 1. Walking, followed by standing, stopping and standing, followed by sitting. When people live avoiding what God wants, not allowing what he wants to shape life, they go from bad to worse. Walking in step with the wicked leads to standing in the way of sinners, joining in with them, which in turn leads to sitting in the company of mockers, comfortable, settled in sin, even despising and scoffing at those who avoid sin. With the result, look at verse 4. It tells us what these wicked are like. In contrast to the blessed man who's like a tree planted by streams of water, the wicked are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Now, I'm no farmer. Some of you might be. You live in a farming area. Chaff is the ultimate in what is rootless, weightless, and useless. When wheat is winnowed, the chaff is the useless stuff that's separated from the useful stuff. It's light. It's just thrown away. And it's those who avoid what God wants and allow peer pressure to sin to shape their lives. It's what they become like. Worthless. Dead. 
unserviceable. Therefore, look at verse 5. They will not stand in the judgment. Those who stand in the way of sinners now will have no defense. They won't have a leg to stand on when they come before God as their judge. They will not, verse 5 continues, be among the assembly of the righteous, those who are right in God's eyes for all eternity. Verse 6, the way of the wicked leads to destruction, eternal punishment. One of the things Psalm 1 does is it opens our eyes to see what we don't otherwise see. And that is the outcome for those who do not walk in step with God. Isn't it true that the wicked dominate our headlines? Isn't it true that the ways of sinners seem to prosper? Isn't it true that those who mock God's ways seem to be the influential in our society? They seem to have a very permanent and prominent voice. But Psalm 1 says that will not always be so. Because God the judge before whom all will one day appear says the wicked are like the chaff. God will come with his winnowing fork in his hand. He will separate the wheat from the chaff and the chaff will perish. Now I've gone through the psalm deliberately like that. I want you to see the striking contrast. What's the contrast? Between the blessed one and the wicked many. We're supposed to see this contrast could not be greater. But why do we need to see that this morning? Well, because of the second thing Psalm 1 shows us. It shows us why we need Jesus. The blessed one. I guess we'd all like to share the distinctives of the blessed one. But do we? I don't know your life story, but have we avoided always the peer pressure to sin? Have we always, day and night, allowed what God wants to to shape, to mould our lives? By nature, the Bible says, we're all born in the camp of the wicked many. And I think that's why verse 1 refers to, look at it again, the blessed one. It's singular. Who is this unique individual who stands apart from every other person in the world who's ever lived? Well, you know it's the Lord Jesus, don't you? I was reading just the other day in a book about preaching and uh, and the writer of this book said this. It said, the Bible is Jesus' autobiography. Uh, This book is his book. Genesis to Revelation are 66 mirrors held up by the Spirit of God so that you and I might see Jesus in all his excellence. I read recently, a little while ago actually now, about a student uh, and he was reading Mark's Gospel for the first time. Uh, And what he read blew him away. And this is what he was quoted as saying. He said, wow, Jesus is amazing. He never did anything wrong. What a cool guy. Now that's not the language I'd use, but it's the language of someone in whom God's Holy Spirit was starting to work. Uh, When on that first Easter Sunday, the risen Lord Jesus, you remember the story? He he walked with two of the disciples on the Emmaus Road. Uh, And Luke 24 tells us that beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. That must have included Psalm 1. Did the Lord Jesus on the road to Emmaus say, you remember Psalm 1, that blessed man, that blessed one? That's describing me. He is the blessed one. The man apart, showing the distinctives of the blessed one. Our Lord Jesus was tempted to sin just as we are, but he avoided walking in step with the wicked, the sinners, and the mockers. Rather, his life was shaped by God's law. 
Uh, when the devil tempted Jesus to sin, how did he respond? He quoted the law of God. It is written. It all made him like a fruitful tree. The tree of the life of our Lord Jesus was full of good fruit. The will of God prospered in his hand, including most of importantly of all, his coming to bring wicked sinners like me into step with himself. Uh, let me quote to you two of the most well-known verses that we find in the New Testament. And as we do, I want you to look at verses 5 and 6, all right? And see how the language fits. First of all, the most well-known verse in the whole Bible, and I want you to look at verse 6 as I read this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, which is the same word as destruction in verse 6, but have eternal life. Now look at verse 5. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus, the blessed one, he came and lived on, on earth the life I haven't lived. He then died the death I deserve to die. He took upon himself the destruction, the perishing that I deserve. All so that I, a wicked man, might be rescued from that destructive path and start walking in step with him. At Jesus, the perfect one who had no sin, he became sin for me that I, a sinner, might be made right with God for now and for all eternity and therefore be part of the eternal assembly of the righteous in heaven. Do you see what Psalm 1's about? To quote another part of the New Testament, what Psalm 1 does is to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And if you're not yet a Christian, the purpose of Psalm 1 is not tell you, try harder to be like the blessed one in this psalm. That is not the message of the psalm. The message of the psalm is we cannot live the blessed life without Jesus. We cannot live the blessed life without first trusting him, the blessed one. But if even this morning we will turn from walking in step with the wicked many, and put our trust in Jesus, the blessed one. Do you know what he does? He brings us into step with himself. And we then discover that Psalm 1 is the way in which he calls us to live life. In step with him, which is the third thing. You see, it then shows us what it means to walk in step with the blessed one. In step with Jesus. He enables us to avoid what he avoided. Instead with Jesus, he enables us to delight in what God delights, becoming like trees planted by streams of water. Now, I do need to underline this fact. That Psalm 1 is not setting out a way for us to reform or save ourselves. Its purpose is to show us Jesus in all his perfection, that we might then say, Lord Jesus, I, I've got to trust you. I, I don't have the ability to live this way myself, but Lord Jesus, just as you called men to follow you, to walk with you as you walked on earth, Lord Jesus, I want, as they did, to put my life in your hands and say, Lord Jesus, I want life to be about walking in step, walking in relationship with you. there was a chorus we used to sing in the youth group a long time ago in Edinburgh. I won't sing it, but it had this line in it, which I've never forgotten. It says, there's no peace, no joy, no thrill like walking in his will. And it's true. The daily battle of the Christian life, including when you're on holiday as I am at the moment, 
is avoiding the way of the wicked through delighting in and meditating upon God's word. Uh, You see, walking in step with Jesus, what will be the evidence of that? Well, increasingly, we'll delight in what God wants. We'll read the Bible. Have you heard the difference between uh, the way Chinese people and British people read the Bible? Have you heard this? This It was a Chinese man told me this. All right? He said, you British people, when you read the Bible, you read across the page and you go, no, no, no. But he says, us Chinese people, because our writing goes up and down, when we read the Bible, we're going, yes, yes, yes. But that's the Psalm 1 way of life, isn't it? How did our Lord Jesus walk through life? He delighted in his Father's will. How are we to walk in step with Jesus through life? As we do walk in step with him, as we say, Lord Jesus, I want to walk in step with you. I, I, I can't do it on my own. Would you help me by your spirit? The result will be that increasingly we'll delight in God's will, which enables us then to avoid the peer pressure to sin. and means that then actually the lovely fruit of his spirit starts to grow in our life. Are you chewing over God's word day and night? I mentioned to my dad, he's very old now, um, I I mentioned to him, I'm preaching on Psalm 1. Uh, And he said, ah, Psalm 1, he said, it always makes me think of Mr. Gant. Mr. Gant was the Bible class teacher through whom my dad became a Christian. And I said, why does it make you remind you of Mr. Gant? He says, oh, Mr. Gant made us all learn Psalm 1 off by heart. And in an earlier generation, scripture memory was encouraged. You know, one of my fears that nowadays we think scripture memory is only for the children or those who are really keen. But when's the last time you memorized some scripture? It's a way of ensuring that we're meditating on God's word day and night. I have to say, I'm really glad Tom's asked me to preach on Psalm 1 this morning. Because it's made me meditate and think through Psalm 1 that I haven't done for quite a long time. I remember as a younger man learning Psalm 1 in the old authorised version. It's made me think, I've got to learn this again. I'm going to try and do it on holiday in the NIV. It's challenged me as I've woken up in the morning. Do I need to listen to the radio for half an hour while I shower and shave? Why listen to the counsel of the wicked when I could instead be meditating on God's word? It's challenged me about what I listen to in the car. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to listen to the radio. I'm not saying that watching the TV is wrong. I'm not saying reading books or magazines other than the Bible is wrong. But I do know this, that what I see and what I listen to, what I read, it it shapes the way I think. And whatever shapes my thinking shapes my living. And whatever shapes my living, according to Psalm 1, shapes my destiny. So one old writer put it like this. Sin will keep you from this book. But this book will keep you from sin. And one of the proofs that we are in step with the Lord Jesus, is that, yes, we will increasingly be avoiding that peer pressure to sin as we increasingly, with the help of the Holy Spirit, delight in what God wants. And so keep walking in step with our Lord Jesus. Now, going back to where we started, that will put us out of step with everyone else. It's not an easy place sometimes to be. We're walking in step with someone who is unseen. He's real, he's risen, but he's unseen. There will be those who will mock us. There will be those who will try to drag us off the path. That's why look at verse 6. It's important we see this as we close. Look at the promise of verse 6. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. He watches over us. The idea is of someone who cares for us. He loves it that we're walking in step with the Lord Jesus. He loves it that we're walking his way, that we're learning increasingly to delight in what he wants. And he watches over us and he will bring us safely 
to that assembly of the righteous. And just to tell you something slightly technical, there is an interesting fact about this psalm. It starts by talking about the blessed one, and it's singular, which is why it points most perfectly to Jesus. But when it talks about the righteous in verses 5 and 6, it is the plural. And it would seem, probably without knowing it, that the Holy Spirit-inspired author is referring to those who are made righteous by Jesus, the blessed one. Those of us who are trusting the Lord Jesus and who will therefore be righteous for all eternity in that great assembly of God's made righteous people. So as I end, I think actually Psalm 1 is pretty simple. It divides us into one of two camps. And my question therefore as I end is this. Which side of the divide are you on? Are you someone who, by God's grace, is living in step with Jesus, the blessed one? Or are you still, as we all did once, living in step with the wicked many? The only way to this blessed life is through faith in the blessed one. He came. He lived the perfect life none of us have lived. He died on the cross taking the death we deserve. He rose again. And he invites us to turn from going the way of the wicked many and instead to trust him as the one who will lead us in step with him on the blessed, on the best, on the happiest way of living. Psalm 1. I'm glad it starts the book of Psalms. Because what is the Christian life? It's a relationship. A relationship. It's walking in step with Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, We bow before you this morning, acknowledging that you are the blessed one described in Psalm 1. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have lived perfectly how none of us have lived. Lord Jesus, we thank you that although you were tempted in every way as we are, you were without sin. You avoided the peer pressure to sin that was as strong and fierce for you as it is for any of us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you you delighted in your Father's will. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you lived as a fruitful tree planted by streams of water. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you lived that perfect life in order to die for us, to die in our place, that we might be forgiven, that we might be put right with God for all eternity, and that we might, by your Spirit, then join you in this blessed life increasingly walking in step with you by the power of your Spirit. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you for Psalm 1. As even this day and this week, we will feel the pressure to walk in the way of the wicked, to stand with sinners, to sit in the seek of mockers. Lord Jesus, please, would you... You give us a a, a renewed hunger for your word, a desire to meditate upon your word, that your word might shape our lives. And there would be something of that flourishing tree-ness and fruitfulness in the way we live. 
Lord Jesus, our hope, our trust is in you, the blessed one. Hear our prayer for your namesake.